Please pray with me. May only God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. Geologically, it's actually a lake, the lowest freshwater lake in the world, a vital source of life for the people of the promised land, with waters known not only as fresh, but as sweet. It's fed by the River Jordan, you know, but also, you might not know this, by some underwater springs. So it's a body of water both sacred and primordial. Since the invasion in Jesus' day, they called it the Sea of Tiberias, after the resort that the Romans had built on the western shore. For the Jews and other old timers, it was the Sea of Galilee, or even the Sea of Gennesaret. Some said if you looked at it from above, from a heavenly viewpoint, it would in the shape of David's harp. It was after a controversial sermon that Jesus had to escape his hometown with his life, fleeing to the northern shores of that sea. I always wondered why all, out of all the places he went there, to, to the village of Capernaum on, on the north shore there. This community of 1,500 or so, well, was a place of a synagogue, a strong one, in fact. I went there one time uh, when I had a tour of the Holy Land, a pilgrimage, in fact. Uh, you can walk in the ruins of the next synagogue after Jesus' day, one that was built in the fourth century. Uh, but on that spot, Jesus preached there, and uh, he walked those streets. He lived there. Some say, I've read, that Capernaum was a fine place to escape from the persecution of Herod Antipas, who ruled Galilee and had killed John the Baptist, his cousin. And Capernaum would have given ready access to the Golan Heights, the realm of another governor in times of danger. It was also near an important road that led to the great city of Damascus. So it's a good place to meet and build a movement and to spread the word. Matthew was collecting taxes on that road before he met Jesus. Peter, Andrew, James, and John were fishing from those shores when he met them. This place would become the center of his ministry before he set his face towards Jerusalem. He preached at the synagogue, but he also took his preaching beyond the walls. After all, the crowds were getting so big he preached from a hilltop in the country. One of his most famous sermons was given there. When I went to Galilee on pilgrimage, I was taken to one place where it was said that Jesus preached uh, on a cliff uh, over the shore of the Sea of Galilee, which served as a kind of natural amphitheater for the crowd. And there was this outcropping of rock that created a kind of amplifier of the human voice. It didn't take much imagination. You could sit up there and look out upon uh, the cliff below and the sea, and you, and you could imagine the crowds gathered there, listening for his voice. He also taught on the shore, and when necessary, from a boat on the water, another place to be seen and heard. And not only that, a place to witness signs and wonders, which we just heard read about in our second reading, that astonishing draft of fish. Now, this giant haul of fish, expected by Jesus, but unexpected by all fishermen of any experience, a kind of professional impossibility. This haul of fish caused Simon, the fisherman, to fall to his knees and declare not just astonishment, but his unworthiness. Simon, who will become Peter, is astonished and convinced that Jesus is from God. But this doesn't lead him to embrace Jesus, cling to him, but in a way to recoil. His impulse is to have Jesus leave his presence because he's not good enough or even unclean. This is what he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Is it shame? 
Or is it a desire to protect Jesus from his own ill repute? Whatever reason, in the sight of all, Simon outs himself as a sinner. A grave thing to say publicly in a village with such faith as Capernaum. Despite this awkward disclosure, Jesus proclaims in the sight of all as well that this is hardly disqualifying, that he has a part to play that matches his business skill quite ably. Fear not, fisherman, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. So not only does Jesus release Simon from his sin, but he points out a path to release him from his fear, to follow him. Just as Simon used to pull a heavy load to the surface of the water, with, with Jesus, Simon will lift up many multitudes to the surface, to a higher plane, to a more heavenly life here on earth, beyond their familiar world, out of the deep where sin sticks and fear rules, to the open air where sins are released and the angelic proclamation, fear not, is the rule of the land. If the image of being one of the good shepherd's sheep is off-putting, well, how much more so is being one of the fish caught by the good fisherman? I mean, think about what happens to a fish after it's caught by a net. Not very pleasant, right? We might prefer the pastoral to the maritime imagery in Jesus' thought. I mean, a sheep has a place to be, a pasture, a caregiver, a relatively long life, a fish caught a fish out of water, well, gasping for breath, eyes agape, flapping about, glistening in the sun that it's not used to. Who wants to be that? And yet this was the image that stuck in the early days. The early Christians would put an image of the fish on their personal seals. We know about that from a letter from Clement of Alexandria. And many of you know the, of the secret symbol of the fish, how Christians who were not, didn't want everyone to know that they were Christian would write a, a part of a fish in the ground. And if you were a Christian too, you would write the next part in the ground and you would see a fish there. And that would identify you so you could stay safe but still be in communion. They were comfortable with the thought that they were a fish who had been caught by God's net. Lives forever changed by some net. And this is not like the Galilean fish who are taken above their plane of existence to be served on a platter on a resort in Tiberias. Instead, they've been transmitted from an old life to a new one. One could talk about it as a kind of death, yes, or perhaps better, a new birth. Not a fish out of water, but a translation from a dead sea to a living one. And I was thinking about my sermon while you were singing that spectacular piece by Habakkuk, and I saw this line, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The idea that there's going to be a great flood, but not a flood of destruction, but a flood of knowledge. And what will we need to be to live in a place like that? Well, we're going to have to learn how to breathe underwater. By the time of Augustine of Hippo, they had a long history of referring not only to themselves as fish, but as to Jesus as a fish, as a big fish, the ichthus, who swam among us in the abyss of our mortality, Augustine says, as though in the depths of the sea he swam among us and was somehow able to remain alive, that is, free from sin. And it is Christ the fish who led us little fish out of the dead waters of mortality into the immortal waters of baptism. And so whether as a fish or as a dove, Christ still roams these waters, drawing ever more of us beyond the surface to new waters of grace and healing. Some of you are just starting to sense this perhaps. For others, this has been a long journey. Some of you have heard the call and said yes, and your life has never been the same. 
Perhaps some part of you died, and something even more alive took its place. Your heart of stone was plucked out like, from, like as a, by a net, and, and something else was put within, something more warm and soft. A melted heart, made for the love of Christ, made for the mercy of God. God and his friends above are the ones who yearn to catch us. And we are the singular fish of creation that yearn to be caught, to be called from these murky, swirling depths and drawn to new waters, to the glory of the Lord that surrounds us as the waters cover the sea, to a life that is beyond life, even as we live it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.